Bali. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the third session for uh, teachers uh, in Karnataka uh, with the CRIS um, unit. We're very happy to be here today. My name is Deepali Dharmaraj and I'm Assistant Director Academic with British Council India. I lead on our teacher development work here. Uh, so like I said, this is the third uh, webinar in a series of five webinars that we are uh, doing for CRIS. Uh, and I'm going to share my screen now and begin the presentation. Remember that you can uh, put your questions, post your questions in the question and answer section. Uh, and we will have time at the end to respond to them. Right. So uh, as you can see on your screen, uh, under, the topic of today is understanding approaches to inclusive learning. So in this uh, session today, we will discuss how are learners same or different? Finding out more about your learners, attitudes towards inclusive learning and a learning centered classroom. Please note here the use of learning and not learners because the focus is on learning. So this is uh, an overview of what we will discuss today. Right, so before we begin the session, uh, can you tell me about yourselves? So can you tell us, answer these four questions, put your responses in the chat. What are you really good at? What makes you curious? What makes you excited? And how do you learn best? So there are four questions. You can answer one, you can answer them all. I just like to see your answers. I'll give you a few minutes for that. So tell us what are you good at? What makes you curious? What makes you excited? And how do you learn best? I'm going to give you a few minutes because uh, it takes time for the uh, chats to appear. Please note that you can name yourself also. Uh, so when you're posting, you don't need to post as anonymous. I'll give you another couple of minutes to put your responses in the Q&A to the questions that are on your screen. Uh, somebody has put a question in saying that they're not getting the video, but uh, maybe if you click, I don't know how you're joining, whether by a uh, phone or on your computer, uh, just click on the, uh, the picture and you'll be able to see the video. OK, someone says they're really good in communication. Thank you very much for that. Good at listening, Divya. Thank you very much. That's very good that you're good at listening. It's one of the qualities that a teacher needs. So thank you for saying that. Rather typing it in. Good at art. That's interesting.
Okay, so I'll move on to the next uh, slide then. I can see that um, there might be some lag in the way that you are experiencing the video. So we'll move on. The purpose of this activity was to find out and uh, sort of show that we are all different. Uh, so you saw that one person is good at listening, another person is good at art, someone may be good at music, someone may be good at sports. So all of us are different. And the way that we learn is also different. So for example, when I learn and when I'm studying, I like to listen to music when I learn, when I'm studying. Uh, that really helps me focus and concentrate. And I particularly when I'm listening to music, I don't like like pop music, I like listening to, they're called lo-fi beats. So I like listening to a certain type of music. So in that way, we are all different. And just as we are all different, our learners are also all different. So that was the purpose of this particular activity. So we all like different things. We learn and act differently in various situations and we all have something to contribute. We need to look at our students as unique individuals. Right. So how are our learners the same or different? Think about students in your class. How are they similar and how are they different? You don't need to put your answers in the chat. Just think about it. The key is to know how to include them. So what is inclusive learning, inclusive education, inclusive teaching is where everybody feels part of the lesson. There is nobody who feels left out. And in order to be able to include your learners, you need to know your learners. That's the first step to inclusive teaching and learning. You must know your learners. An important role for the teacher is to notice what barriers a learner may have at any time and whether it is connected to a learning preference. A learning preference, I gave you an example. Some people, for example, like to listen to music. Other people don't, they, they need absolute silence. So why is it important to know the differences? Uh, the main thing that we need to remember is that learners it may not be immediately obvious. We may not be able to see it immediately, but the way people learn and the fact that we are all different affects the way that we work, the way that we learn. And thinking about differences helps uh, us uh, to identify uh, students as individuals, but we also need to think about the ways that students are similar or the same. So we have to look at differences as well as similarities as teachers. So how can you find out more about your learners? So you can see this um, picture here that says the more you know about your learners, the more you can include them in the learning process. So in the chat, can you please tell me how can you find out about your learners? What are the ways in which you can find out about your learners? So for example, I'll give you an example. You can talk to other teachers. So if you're teaching sports, for example, you can talk to the Hindi teacher. If you're teaching Hindi, you can talk to the English teacher of your student. Of course, if you're a primary teacher and you're teaching all subjects, <laughs> then it might be a good idea to uh, talk to parents or for example, the sports teacher, because I'm sure uh, I, you know, possibly you don't teach sports also. So can you please tell me in the chat, how can you find out about your learners? What are some ways that you can find out about your learners? So I can see some of you are still typing in your names. 
Uh, good afternoon. Some people are saying good afternoon. You're still answering the previous uh, question, which is I'm good at reading and speaking. Behavior. OK, I just saw that coming in behavior. Yes, you can know about your learners by watching their behavior. That's a very good point. By test and interaction, thank you so much, uh, Subramaniam sir or ma'am. Um, by seeing children and talking to them. Thank you very much. Those are really great answers. Yes, by observing your students, by looking at their behavior, by talking to other teachers, by testing and tests and assessments are a good way of knowing your learners. Right. So we've covered this. Uh, so some other ways of finding out about your learners. These are just some suggestions. Create an open classroom environment. So create an environment in your classroom where learners can contribute ideas and they can speak up. That way you will get to know them better. Build on prior knowledge. So build on what students already know. Share information about yourself. Uh, very often we as teachers, uh, you know, we come into a classroom, we want to finish the syllabus, we want to finish the lesson and students don't really know who we are. So tell your students about your likes, your dislikes, your hobbies. Share about yourself. They, the more they think about you as a human being, uh, the more they will open up about their own uh, lives. Uh, you can also get feedback from students from feedback sheets or polls or questionnaires and you can find out about your students. Maybe you can do a questionnaire on what is your favorite color, food, animal, etc. And you can find out about your learners that way. You can plan a variety of activities which allows learners to show different abilities. So music, art, drama, uh, you know, those are all activities that you can bring into the classroom so that you can see who's good at what. Uh, so, for example, I'm I'm good at music, but I'm lousy at art. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, you could find that out immediately. Uh, and we all have our strengths and areas of development. Uh, some of you have uh, mentioned this already. You observe your learners, listen to other teachers. This was already covered. Right. I'm going to pull up uh, some statements now on the screen and I would like you to uh, decide how much you agree with these teachers on a scale of one to five. Please note that one means strongly agree and five means strongly disagree. So if you strongly agree with a statement, say put one and if you strongly disagree with the statement, put five. Uh, you can write it down uh, in a notebook or something. You don't need to put your answers in the chat. This is more uh, of a self-assessment, a self-awareness exercise to see where you are. So this first teacher says, all learners are unique and have their own strengths. So do you strongly agree with this statement? Or do you strongly disagree? All learners are unique and have their own strengths. The next one is, I should plan for every learner to achieve in my lesson. So should, do you agree with this statement or do you disagree? The next teacher says we should not have learners with special education needs or sense in our classroom. Do you agree or disagree? Thank you. I can see that some of you are putting uh, your answers in the Q&A. That's really great. Thank you for your interaction. That's really fantastic. So num we're on number C now. I'm moving on to the next one. Good teaching strategies can help all learners in the class. 
Yes, I can see someone has said by knowing their, their last year results of uh, progress. Um, I'm just coming to that. Uh, their progress card or by the last test marks which he or she taken by their attitude in the classroom while teaching. Yes, very good. Right, so we are on D now. Good teaching strategies can help all learners in the class. The next one is we are teachers, not psychologists. We cannot assess a special need. So think about your own experience as a teacher. Have you been able to identify any special needs in your students? Or do you think as teachers that's not our job? We, we can't do it. I'm moving on to the next one now. Number F, we're on F. There is a continuum. A continuum is a, uh, you know, it's not a fixed start and finish. There's a long kind of a scale. There's a continuum of level of, of need, and we should be flexible about this in our planning. That means it's not a yes or a no, but some people need more just like this uh, scale that you're using to respond to this particular exercise. One to five. It's a scale of one to five. So this teacher says there is a continuum of level of need and we should be flexible about this in our planning. So do you agree or disagree? Do you think that we as teachers need to be flexible with our planning? G, inclusive learning is useless. For my stronger and more able learners who are more held back by weaker ones or those with sin. So this teacher feels that uh, inclusive learning is useless for stronger learners. OK. And finally, the different views and ways of thinking that many learners with SEM ha SEN have are engaging for everyone and also for me. So this teacher believes that it's actually good to have spe learners with special education needs in their classroom. They actually they think it's a good idea because uh, SEN learners add value to the classroom. Do you agree or disagree? So I'll just pause for a minute or so to let you put in your answers. There's a little bit of a la lag when we use Teams Live. So uh, I just need to pause a bit and allow you to put in your answers. These are all the statements from teachers and of course the uh, statements that they have shared are related to what's coming next in the session. So I can see some of you are putting agree, disagree. It would be nice for you to put uh, um, the number. Yes, I can see Niranjan. Thank you very much. In spite of needs, I believe in different abilities of our students. Fantastic. That's a really good uh, attitude and it's really great to see that in uh, you and in teachers overall. Great. E is three, not sure. OK. OK, I'll move on then. So there are overall, uh, I mean, there are many models of inclusion, but in this session we will look at two models of inclusion. So uh, of course the topic today is approaches to, uh, you know, a learning centered classroom. So how do you become, how do you make your classroom inclusive? Uh, so the approaches that we use, the two models that uh, are available to us to decide on how we can go forward making our lessons and classrooms inclusive. There are two main types. So let's look at the first one. 
So this is the medical model of inclusion. In this model, there is a diagnosis of special education needs. It can be useful, but it is for clinical professionals to make and not teachers. So the medical model of inclusion believes that doctors or medical professionals should make a diagnosis and uh, uh, people with special education needs are seen as patients and uh, it's not teachers don't have a role to play in this model of inclusion. An over focus on medical diagnosis usually and identifies individuals as the problem to be fixed. So very often learners get labeled. So you may have heard uh, labels like slow learners, uh, you know, uh, retarded. Uh, there are many labels that are placed on learners as a result of following the medical model of inclusion, where it's medical professionals and not teachers and students are a problem that are to be fixed. If there's a special education need, it's a problem, it's not a need, and it needs to be fixed. There is another model of inclusion, and that is called the social model of inclusion. Now, in this model of inclusion, it works on solutions for achievement for all learners. So it doesn't look at learners as being a problem, but it looks as at the needs and it says, OK, here is a need. How can I ensure that this learner with this need can achieve uh, what needs to be achieved? And of course, achievement levels will also vary for all students. So starting from positive contributions that all learners can make and then noticing and understanding any difficulties that need to be worked on. Research shows that learners enjoy learning in learning centered classroom and the learning is long term and deep. So you can see that here are the two models of inclusion that I've shared with you. The first is the medical model of inclusion, which looks at learners as being a problem that a, a medical practitioner needs to make a diagnosis and then the problem needs to be fixed. But in the social model of inclusion, the need is identified. Uh, the uh, learning is uh, delivered, teaching and learning is transacted in a way that there is achievement for all. What achievement it is may look different. Positive contributions are accepted and welcomed. And also research shows that this is the model of inclusion that works uh, in the classroom. So I hope that uh, you will explore more about the social model of inclusion. Let's compare the two. So let's compare the medical model and the social model. So you can see in this table on the screen. The medical model looks at child as a problem, but the social model, the system is the problem. In the medical model, professionals identify the problem. And in the social model, teachers notice the needs. So in fact, teachers see what the, the what the needs are of that particular student. A medical model believes in labeling and categorization, so it puts all the slow learners in one group and it calls them slow learners, whereas the social model looks at individual learning needs to be met, so it doesn't categorize or label learners. Medical model looks at diagnosis and treatment whereas the social model looks at removal of barriers. Please zoom it. I can't zoom it, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. You can do it on your screen. The medical uh, model looks at medical interventions, so maybe uh, prescriptions of uh, you know, medication, etc. Whereas the social model looks at outcomes. Everybody, like I said, everybody will achieve different outcomes. It's not the same outcome for all learners. Uh, the medical model believes in segregation, that is separation and putting people in boxes, you know, in categories, whereas the social model believes in integration, bringing people and students together. 
And finally, in the medical model, society remains unchanged, uh, but in the social model, society evolves. Also, we learn to respect uh, everybody, you know, people with special education needs are just as valuable and important in the classroom as quote unquote others. <laughs> uh, OK, so I will now move on to the next section of the presentation. Which is a learning center classroom. So the definition of a learning center classroom is here on your screen. I give you a minute to read it. So it says a learning center classroom is one where the focus is on learning rather than any one method or approach. This means that it could include many types of activities and ways of working to ensure that learners develop the academic, social and problem solving skills to become confident, successful and happy members of society as well as lifelong learners. So we as teachers want to make our students confident, successful, happy, but we also want them to develop a love for learning because when students love learning, then they will keep learning all their lives. And that's what we want from our students, don't we? Right, so when the focus is on learning, these are some advantages or benefits of having a learner centered class, learning centered classroom, sorry. So the power between teachers and learners is shared. So as a teacher, I'm not above the students, but I'm at on par. You know, it's a it's a democratic classroom. The focus is often on finding out, understanding, using and sharing content instead of one right answer. Like, you know, uh, is this is this black instead of that? Uh, you know, uh, the question could be, what is that used for? Can you think of other ways of using this? So there is a focus. The focus, of course, it's important for uh, students to identify colors. I'm not saying that that's not important, but the focus of the classroom is shifts to understanding and finding out. Uh, maybe a way of, uh, you know, teaching colors could be find other objects that are the same color. So that way students are finding out about things. Um, resources are appropriate to the learner and the task. So resources or TLMs, teaching learning materials that you use are not too difficult, not too easy. They are at the right level. The learner often has responsibility for learning and needs specific qualities and skills. So like I mentioned earlier that we want learners to become um, uh, lifelong learners and you need certain qualities to be a lifelong learner. Uh, the role, the teacher's role is to support that in a variety of ways. Assessment is there to support learning and assesses what each learner has learned. This may be different for different learners. And the process and processes of evaluation are there to support the classroom. So these are all the benefits of a learning center classroom. So how do we then make a move to a learning center classroom? What are some principles or things that we can do? I'm just looking in the chat to see if there are any questions that uh, may need to be answered. I don't see any at the moment. Uh, Dipali, there was one question on how can we build on the variety approach? From one teacher, okay. I'm I'm not familiar with the variety approach per se, but uh, perhaps these 10 uh, principles that I'm going to share uh, will uh, shed some light on that. So let's look at that moving to a learning center classroom. So there are 10, maybe, uh, basically 10 ways. These are not, it's, the list is not exhaustive, please. There are not only 10 ways. There are many more ways that you can uh, move to a learning center classroom, but these are just 10 so, some ways that you can. Uh, so the first is to celebrate diversity. And this is about ensuring positive contributions from everyone, whatever the learning differences and difficulties. 
The unique contribution of everyone is valued, which may be through visuals, texts, images, audio, etc. So there are, uh, you know, celebrating diversity rather than making everybody uh, like, a, you know, follow a cookie cutter model where everybody looks the same or feels the same or interacts the same way. The next one is to remove clutter. What does clutter? Clutter is a word that has been is thrown around quite often nowadays, especially if you, uh, you know, you're into minimalism and you like to follow that approach. So clutter is uh, anything that detracts or uh, distracts uh, from the purpose of promoting learning. This might be the teacher's instructions. If a teacher is talking too much in the class, that might be clutter. It's audio clutter that happens. Or if the teacher is talking too little, uh, if there are too many visuals in the classroom, that could also cause clutter. And it's all about making meaning comprehensible and understandable. So you have to enable uh, students to comprehend and understand the lesson. Also finding out if there are factors outside the classroom that may impact on learning and that a teacher needs to understand. So for example, I mean, in the, the British Council is very um, one of our values is that we uh, protect children and child protection is everyone's responsibility. Now, if a child is being abused at home, be it sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse or neglect, that affects the child's ability to learn and interact in the classroom. So as a teacher, being aware of something like this will also enable you to become more empathetic to the child and also enable you to teach the child more effectively. Have clear, uh, achievable and measurable learning outcomes. Very often as teachers, we want to do everything uh, in one lesson and that's not possible. Or we have very high um, uh, expectations of our students in what they will be able to achieve in a lesson. So ensuring that our learning outcomes are clear, achievable and measurable uh, will enable us to move to a learning center classroom. So in this approach, it ensures this approach, sorry, ensures that everyone can positively participate and learning can be measured according to appropriate and agreed criteria. Everyone works to agreed learning outcomes, perhaps taking different routes, and we can start from where the learners are and what they can do rather than where you want them to go. So where are they? Begin with that first. Number four is scaffold teaching and learning. So scaffold means to give uh, targeted support at specific times. And this involves a structure. So a scaffold is like, you know, on, on the outside of a building. When you uh, when you're painting the building or doing some maintenance and repair work, uh, you know, the, the scaffold is that structure that they build around it to ensure that the building uh, is, you know, the progress uh, is ensured. So in the same way, when we want when we are teaching, we scaffold teaching and learning the process so that there are support structures in place for students and students have certain points where they can they know that they can come to us for help or uh, support. I'm just checking the time. OK, so we're good to go. Uh, so sorry, I should have kind of read that. Um, scaffolding involves a structure that promotes a safe learning environment and achievable aims and activities. It also creates space for the learner to develop and understand new ideas and ways of learning. The next one is differentiate. You may have already done a lot, uh, undergone a lot of training about differentiating activities. It involves providing different learning routes for everyone based on their learning needs, but focusing on achieving similar standards. So you're all heading to one point, but people, uh, you know, learners may take different routes to get to that point. That is differentiation. Number six is plan and cater for accessibility, access, needs and achieve uh, engagement. So this is concerned with environmental factors such as ensuring physical conditions allow for inclusion and equality of access to learning. So for example, if you're doing a running dictation activity or an activity that requires people to get up and run and change places, a child in a wheelchair is not going to be able to do that um, in the same way 
that other learners do it. They can still do it, but they can't do it in the same way. So you do need to think about how you're going to do the activity that is uh, so that it's possible for all learners to participate. So this may involve the physical conditions in a class or room or access via technology. Also meeting needs of learners with visual impairments such as braille versions or screen readers or dyslexic friendly fonts or assistive technology for learners with speech and language needs. This ensures learners can participate in learning. It is concerned with supporting positive achievement. Number seven, start from and link to what, or what is already learned, known. So we've already said that we start from what learners know, not from what needs to be learned. We start from the learn the learning that, you know, the, the knowledge that learners have at the moment. Uh, that needs to be the starting point. We then link to what needs to be learned. This is an effective way of building learning. This may be top, a topic of interest, so everyone can be engaged in what needs to be understood and learned. It is important to be inclusive in terms of interest is there something for everyone? So that's the question that you need to ask. Is there something for everyone? Will everyone be interested in this particular topic or lesson? And if not, and if it's still part of the syllabus, how can you generate interest? Number eight is use multi-sensory and multimodal approaches. Most people have preferences regarding text, visual, auditory, or kinesthetic ways of learning. However, integrated multimodality approaches are the most um, the most inclusive and are likely to be the most successful. The importance of this approach is that it allows for a range of options in reaching the way learners learn. Uh, if content is only delivered through a single sensory channel, that is only through speaking or only through writing, then uh, we are less likely to meet both individual and group needs. <coughs> Sorry. Number nine, ensure an appropriate space for the learner's voice. This is concerned with understanding learning through the experiences of the individual participating in the learning. It also involves actively encouraging and enabling a sharing of responsibility for achieving a productive, purposeful atmosphere through a cooperative learning approach. So this essentially means that ensure that in every lesson, in every class that you take, there is an opportunity for learners to also contribute, not just to give answers to questions that you are asking, but they should be able to articulate or create their own questions also. So have a space in the a time in the lesson when you, you know, it's called throwing the floor open, right? Uh, where you throw the floor open to uh, for students to ask questions. So it's not only the teacher who's asking the question and students giving the answers, but students can also ask questions and, you know, either the teacher answers or other students and peers answer. And finally, number 10, uh, we in, uh, include assessment for learning. So this there's a difference, as you know, uh, between assessment for learning and assessment of learning. Assessment for learning is the formative assessment that we undertake for our learners and it has assessment of learning is the summative assessment. So an inclusive learning assessment approach starts from assessment for learning rather than assessment of learning approach. It is concerned with ongoing or continuous assessment which is achievable at every stage of learning. It is also collaborative between learners uh, learners and teachers and based on what someone can do rather than what they can't do. So that's the importance of assessment for learning. I'm just going to quickly check the chat uh, Q&A to see if there are any questions that have come up. Right, so there's nothing yet. So um, I'm just, I've just we've just put this into a visual for you so you can see it's like a color wheel and if you go clockwise you can see the different um, uh, the different uh, principles or approaches. The first one I'll just recap celebrate diversity, remove clutter, 
have clear, achievable and measurable learning outcomes, scaffold teaching and learning, differentiate, plan and cater for accessibility, access, needs and engagement, start from and link to what is already known, use multi-sensory and multimodal approaches, ensure appropriate space for learn the learner's voice, and finally include assessment for learning. So now over to you. Um, as you as we come to the end of this uh, webinar, I'd like you to think about uh, the following. So select a strategy or approach for a learning center classroom. I just shared the 10 with you. Those are 10 of many that there are, but choose any one of those 10. Think about why did you approve uh, choose why you chose this approach? So why did you choose this approach? What activity will you undertake with this approach? So what will you do exactly? How will it be useful for your learners? And then think about your learners. Have you, for example, ever tried role play or drama activities with your learners? What support do you think your learners need to do role play activities? So this is an example. So if you choose a strategy, think about how it's going to relate to your learners. So at this point, I'm just going to pause and see if there are any questions in the chat or if you have any questions that you'd like to ask before we come to the end of this session. Thank you for the very kind words. Many of you are saying nice, madam, and very nice. So thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Uh, it's difficult because I can't see you and I can't interact with you. Uh, you can see me, of course, uh, but I we just depend on the chat uh, for the interaction. So thank you very much. It's very kind of you to say that. OK, so I can see from Rafiq there's a question. There are some learner who are, ha are afraid to have a say in the class. They are quite afraid and hesitant to speak uh, or speak their mind in a group. What can we do to remove that fear? That's a really great question. And uh, I would just say, uh, you know, it's not possible for us to make an overnight switch. So uh, I'm, we're not, you know, when we're not calling for uh, an immediate kind of change in the way from learners like night and day become different. But take baby steps, small things that you do. So the first thing is, one that I, you know, I feel works very well in classrooms, particularly large classrooms like we have in India is think, pair, share. So first, whenever you're setting up an activity, you're doing an activity and you want answers from the students, follow the think, pair, share procedure where they first think of the answer on their own, then they pair, you put them in pairs and they can talk through the problem or talk through the answer together in pairs and then you open up into the classroom as a plenary to the whole class. You can also have one more uh, step in between where you can do think, pair, group and share. So you first, they first think individually, then they share in pairs, then they share in a small group and then they finally share in a whole class. I feel that using uh, steps like that will help particularly shy learners open up, particularly because in a pair, two people have to speak, right? One person can't keep speaking. So there, ha there has to be this conversation. That's one thing. And the second thing that I would suggest is uh, do it consistently. So do, uh, one time of doing a think pair share is not going to work. It's when you do it consistently over many months that you will find learners opening up and being able to share their answers. The third thing is very often students are hesitant to share answers because they are afraid of either making a mistake or they're afraid that the answer will be wrong. So it's a good idea for us as teachers to also have questions that have no right or wrong answers. And one of the types of questions like that are opinion questions. So uh, you know, do you, who, how many like the color green? So not everybody is going to raise their hands because obviously not everybody likes the color green. 
So ask questions where there is an opinion involved because opinions are not right or wrong. They're not facts, they're opinions. It's, it's subjective. Everybody has a different opinion. Uh, so ask opinion questions and that will help your learners open up more. I hope that has answered your question. Right. So let's move on then. Uh, that's the only question that I have found here. Right. OK, so in this session, then these are the things that we covered. We looked at how our learners same or different. You know, we had the activity where you had the table with two columns and you looked at how they are the same. So, for example, they may be similar in ages, but they would be different in likes and dislikes. They may have the same language, but also in some of your classrooms, there may be it may be a multilingual classroom. There may be many different uh, mother tongues in the classroom. So in the same way, learners are same or different, just as just how we are same or different. Um, we talked about finding out more about your learners. So we looked at specific things that you can do to find out more about your learners. We looked at attitudes to inclusive uh, learning. So we had that um, the different statements from teachers and you had to agree or disagree. We looked at the models of inclusion, the medical and the social model model of inclusion. And finally, we looked at the 10 strategies or approaches to a learning center classroom. I'll just pull that up uh, that slide up. These are the 10 strategies for uh, creating a learning center classroom. OK, so thank you very much. Uh, that is the end of my presentation. Uh, we'll uh, open for questions now if you have any questions. What is the difference between assessment and evaluation? That's a very good, good uh, question. Um, so to my in my knowledge, assessment is related to uh, learning outcomes. Uh, and evaluation could be uh, say of a project that has objectives. So you may have some objectives and you evaluate the objectives, whereas assessment is, uh, you know, related to learning outcomes. Dipali, there's one more question from Mr. Venu Gopal. Uh, he wants to understand the difference between normal learning and inclusive learning. Mm, I would think a normal learning is perhaps learning that doesn't cater for inclusion. Um, but inclusive learning and uh, an inclusive classroom is where we need to go. Uh, I don't know what normal learning, uh, you know, would otherwise mean. Uh, and before we leave, of course, don't forget our session tomorrow. Uh, it's at the same time, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. It's on engaging your learners. And on day five, again, at the same time, we have using British Council resources. So we will be sharing all our free resources and taking you through the process of how uh, you can use them effectively, both in the classroom as well as for your professional development. So tomorrow is engaging your learners and day five Friday using British Council resources. Please do join us then. OK, there's one question here. What can an English lecturer do to create interest about English language in the campus? Uh, do you mean to say that students are not interested in English? I wonder why I love. I always loved learning English. I think uh, developing. So again, I would say there are many different ways. One is um, it's because uh, I feel perhaps students are afraid. They are afraid of making mistakes and they find English difficult. Uh, so I would say don't focus on accuracy, focus more on fluency and what students uh, can be able to do easily. Uh, I would encourage reading for pleasure. Uh, so there are many books at many different levels, uh, maybe starting a reading club uh, where you select a book and go through it over a couple of weeks as a group. 
uh, that's a great way of uh, you know ensuring that students are interested in English. Um, I would also identify local in writers who write in English. You know, so there is you build, you bring in context because sometimes we can get so caught up in studying Shakespeare or Yeats or Keats, you know, and uh, their contexts are so far removed from students uh, real lives that sometimes it becomes difficult for students to relate and therefore they find uh, English either difficult or dull. Uh, so look for Indian. There are many Indian authors uh, that write really well. Uh, you know, and also there are many different topics that you can select. There are people who write on economics. There are people who write on, you know, social issues. Uh, so looking for local talent, Indian writers. Uh, I know Karnataka has a lot of, uh, you know, very prolific uh, writers who write effectively in uh, English. So, you know, I would suggest approaches like that. Any other questions that you can see Anu and Haima? I'm not able to see any other. Uh, um, thank you so I, much again for your kind words. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's about it. Uh, the I think it's all just uh, uh, there's one that's just come in uh, from Santosh uh, Dipali, if you can see it. Yes. Can we use bilingual method to teach English in a classroom effectively? I would say yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I'm a great believer and supporter, and we are in the British Council of multilingualism, bilingualism, and using the child's uh, mother tongue in the classroom or the child's home language or the other uh, language that the student is most familiar in. Uh, definitely, there are many ways that you can do this. You can code switch, you can use translanguaging, you can use translation. There are many different ways. I believe that using the home language really uh, creates an atmosphere where students feel safe and they feel more confident in learning the language. Uh, we just did, uh, we as in the British Council and University of Cambridge just completed a four year study on this topic on uh, you know multilingualism and whether students learn better uh, in an only English environment or in a multilingual environment where their home language is used. And the four year study uh, found that actually students learn much better when their home language is used in the classroom. So uh, we have our report published and we also developed a handbook uh, for teachers uh, to implement uh, activities, so that's available on our one website. If you Google uh, British Council multilingualism, you will be able to find it. You get it, it'll come up and you can please download that uh, handbook. It's free of cost. It's free to download and it has excellent activities that you can use in the classroom. There are some questions uh, that have come in uh, the Bali. If you want to just have a quick skim. Uh, OK, which book you suggested? So this is um, uh, Haima and Anu. Would it be possible for you to just pull up that link of the uh, it's the multilingualism handbook moving from theory to practice? It's on our website, so maybe that might help. Sure. Um, how can we make a first move to use English even though others are interested? Um, I'm not sure I completely understand that question. Uh, how can we conclude the whole class inclusive in unity of learning? Uh, I think uh, that's a very good question. I think one way of concluding a class is to ask learners to think, pair, share what they learned today. So every class you can say, OK, now dedicate five minutes at the end of the class to a think, pair, share of what did you learn today? And you will find that everybody will have a different uh, thing that they learned, you know, they will all everybody will have learned differently and that's a great way of um, reinforcing inclusion and also celebrating diversity. So I can't see any more questions coming up.
Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Anu, for posting the link. So everyone, you can see the link uh, in the chat box uh, in the Q&A. Uh, this is the uh, using multilingual approaches. It's a resource book free of free to download. Please do download it and use it. And like I said, if you Google multilingualism uh, British Council, you'll be able to uh, you know, find more information on our project. It was called Multi Leela. Multi Leela, Multilingualism and Learning. Multi Leela. I'll just post that in the chat. If you Google Multi Leela project, you'll be able to find. OK, I think that's it then, Anu and Haima. Uh, that, uh, I, don't, I can't see any more questions coming yes. in. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your participation and for your kind words. Um, good luck uh, with uh, your work and also in making your classrooms more inclusive. And please do join us for the remaining two sessions tomorrow and day after. Bye.